Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Katrina. Um, I am a specialist um, student here at Fordham, and I have had the privilege to be the moderator today with um, Dean White Ryan. Um, the teacher talk today is focused on substance abuse treatment. Um, and we have a few questions uh, pre-determined, uh, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. I figure probably the last 20 minutes. So we'll get through as many questions as we can that we uh, talked about beforehand, Dean White Ryan, and then 20 minutes after we'll open up for Q&A. Um, but before we get going much further, I'd like to give the floor to Shadiqwa, who is going to talk a little bit about the Student Congress, um, who is the sponsor for the Teacher Talks. Thank you, Katrina. Welcome, everyone. My name is Shadiqwa, and I'm a co-leader of Student Congress. Student Congress is an organization for students, by students. We provide a space for people to just come and talk about their experiences and socialize. We have four committees. The Academic Development Committee is the one that hosts these teacher talks. Um, different students, like Katrina, coordinate with the faculties as well as the administration. So you'll see professors, assistant professors, deans, and we just get to know a little bit more about their um, experiences and research. And um, we also have the Student Engagement Committee. They host Coffee, Cocktails and Tea, which is a virtual happy hour for students to get together. We do that on our Slack channel. Um, we also have the Communications Committee that is for, um, they pretty much run our Instagram page as well as our student newsletter. You should be getting those in your email, um, I think like every two weeks. And we also have the IDEA committee, which stands for inclusion, diversity, equity, and anti-racism. So we do a lot of work in that area. Um, we will put the student Congress email in the chat as well as our um well so our email and our instagram page and you can just let us know which committees you would like to be a part of or if you just want to learn more about student congress you can do that as well i'll now do introduce dean white ryan and give a brief bio and you guys can get started after that so a little bit about dean white ryan she is the assistant dean and MSW program director for Fordham GSS. She has 25 years experience working in health and mental health. So she's not only a social worker, but she has a nursing background as well. She's developed alcohol and substance abuse prevention workshops and presented in school systems throughout the country. Dean White Ryan's research has focused on substance abuse, behavioral health, and social work education. Her current research agenda involves methods of addressing alcohol and substance abuse problems among America's youth. Dean White Ryan, Dr. White Ryan, has taught advanced clinical assessment and diagnosis, social work practice with abusers of alcohol and other substances, and other clinical courses across the curriculum. She received her PhD in MSW from Fordham GSS. In 2016, Dr. White Ryan was appointed a fellow at the New York Academy of Medicine. So thank you so much for being here. We're gonna learn a lot from her. And I'll kick it off to Katrina and the Dean. Thank you so much, Shadiqwa. Um, I also copy and pasted um, Dr. White Ryan's bio that Shadiqwa just graciously explained to us in the chat so you can learn a little bit more there. So, um, well, I guess let's just get started. Um, so to start off, I would love, we have the bio there, um, and, but I would like to ask um, to go a little bit further in that with your experience working in the field. Um, what is your specialty? Obviously we know that you work with substance abuse, but is there a particular substance or anything like that that you'd like to share with us? Sure, well, thank you so much, Katrina, and thank you to Student Congress for inviting me. It's really impressive as I listen to Shadiqwa talk about Student Congress. I've been here 11 years, and we have never had such a really active Student Congress, and uh, I know how hard you've all worked to come together as a student body, so thank you for inviting me. 
And sure, I can tell you that I came into the field of substance abuse uh, working in, I am a nurse, and first I worked in intensive care early on. And then because of the medical issue, I had back surgery and couldn't lift in the same way, thought my life was over for sure. And I, I, I was young and went into um, psychiatric nursing. And I became a nurse manager and I was attracted to the profession of social work because what I saw from my colleagues that were social workers, I had been trained in the medical model which was at that time a very pathology-based model. So you looked at, we called people patients and they were sick, we were well, and we healed them. And my colleagues in working in inpatient psych who were social workers, I was attracted to their focus on the whole person, body, mind, and spirit. And that really drew me in. Um, and eventually, as you know, it's history. I fell in love with psych and mental health and became a social worker. But what I saw back at that point in time about the field of substance abuse was that there was such a high recidiv recidivism rate. Um, clients with substance abuse issues would come into the hospital and we would do a good job of really starting to work with them. We would send them out. And it seemed that before I turned around at the nurse's station, they were back. And so that was my introduction many, many years ago. And at this point in time, it's way more than 25 years ago, but whatever. Um, and so that was the beginning of my introduction to seeing the significant impact in society and certainly on the people that I was working with um, of substance abuse. So my career, so I went on at that point in time before I went to social work school. I got my case act. I became a credentialed addictions counter, uh, counselor in the state of New York. And I started to learn that addiction was a chronic brain disease and that treatment was possible. However, at that time, treatment was very different than it is today. It, we did not have the focus on neurobiology. Um, what was focused on, it was a very confrontive model. There was no motivational interviewing or meeting the client where they were. But I began to learn from social workers that even though the model was confronted, what my social work colleagues did, they would meet the client where they were. And so I started to learn from them. And it inspired me and motivated me to learn more and more about substance abuse um, and also about the field of social work and eventually to enter it. And what I learned was the significant impact on not only the person who had the addictive disorder, but on the people close to that person. Um, and I began to see that the impact was so widespread and lives were truly ruined due to substance abuse. So my career has focused, in the beginning, I worked with people in early recovery um, I then went on to become a trained interventionist and I traveled the country actually doing, I don't do that anymore because I have no time doing this job, but I really traveled the country. I was trained at the Johnson Institute, which in Minneapolis, and then later on at Hazleton. And um, Minneapolis is truly the mecca of what we called at that time, uh, chemical dependency treatment. And so I got to travel the country doing interventions. My focus as I went on in years became to work, came to work with uh, substance abusers in later recovery for adults, but really with adolescents and their families in my private practice. Um, a lot of my research has been focused on um, work on older adults um, and substance use disorders. I don't know if I answered your question. Did I say too much? No, that was wonderful. I uh, learned a lot more and I am so impressed that you were involved in Minneapolis. Um, that's that's very impressive. <laughs> um, well, it truly so was the Mecca and really Johnson Institute brought to this area of the country, to the Northeast, um, the Midwest. So you think about Minnesota and it, you brought, it, they brought the concept of intervention and substance abuse treatment as we know it today to this area of the country, 
one of the pioneers who is no longer with us was Ruth Maxwell. And I worked, I was trained by Ruth Maxwell at Maxwell Institute. And she truly delivered, you know, when we look at healthcare disparities today, Ruth Maxwell was determined and she was from the Johnson Institute she moved to New York and she was determined to provide care. When I think about working in that agency, it was what people could afford to pay. And so if that was a dollar, but they got treatment, you know, they got actual treatment and she did interventions. So the Maxwell Institute, which still exists today, it's very different, it's hospital centered and it's different, but truly the pioneers from Minnesota brought all of that focus um, to the to the Northeast. And they had a tremendous impact on the way substance use disorder treatment began to be um, integrated into mental health because there was a time that there was, and there's still a little bit, a division. So you had mental health disorders over on one side and you had the substance abuse treatment professionals on the other side. And it is now integrated. We know that it is a mental health disorder. So, yeah, no, that's beautiful um, to hear that from you, which goes into one of the questions that we'd already prepared. So I'd love to go into that in a little more depth. So you spoke a little bit about like the differences in treatment going from kind of the medical model and the division between mental health and substance abuse and starting to marry. Um, can you speak a little bit more to the societal portion of that? Um, so, uh, so, you know, how has that changed in your, your time through, um, through substance treatment? Well, on the societal level, if I'm really honest, it, there is still tremendous stigma. You know, there is even much less so, but there is even stigma in our own profession of healthcare. Because if you, the stigma about mental health disorders in general is huge. The bottom of the rung, the bot, on the bottom of the ladder is considered addictive disorders. So if you think about addictive disorders and you think about treatment, putting even th such things as places, safe places for people to get continuing treatment, halfway houses, what they call three quarter recovery houses. Um, people don't want those people in, they call them those people in their neighborhood. Society has come much further in the last 10 years, healthcare, has truly come a much longer way, but there's still tremendous stigma. Most likely that stigma comes along, it's, it's part and parcel of the behaviors that go along with substance abuse um, because the behaviors are very, very difficult. It often involves stealing, um, lying, and all of that. And that's very hard for people and families to deal with so that it, in society, it's still viewed in certain ways. But I always say to all the students that I work with that you are the new generation of social workers and it's our job to try to decrease stigma as much as possible for people to understand that this is a chronic, re often relapsing disease, the same as other chronic illnesses. If you look at diabetes, if you look at certain cancers, if you look at a disease such as arthritis, people often relapse. The difference is the behaviors that go along with substance abuse that make it very challenging for people to look at it in that way. But it truly is a brain disease it alters the structure and function of the brain um, in a different way than any other illness does. And it has a big impact. It's one of the number one public health crises in our country today. Yeah, and um, to move on that, it is the number one health crisis right now, right? And we're looking at it very specifically at like the opiates um, and how it's affecting so many different subcultures that we had no long, hadn't been working with before. So um, can you speak to that a little bit? Have you seen your patients' uh, demographics change, um, the power privilege? How does that all work with substance abuse? Well, I think one of the things that's important to think, to understand power and privilege, the healthcare disparities in our country are huge. So what is available in the ways of effective treatment for certain parts of the population are not available across the board. As far as opioid addiction, it is one of the number one health crises in our country. 
but it is not a new issue. So if I think of it in this way, and then I'm gonna read you something in a moment about opioids that I think speaks to the history and the long history of the effects of addiction in our society. But um, I can tell you that in the 1990s, we started to view, pain was called um, the fifth vital sign. And so the fifth vital sign was pain. And we were told as a medical community that we were not adequately treating pain for people so that we were not doing our jobs. And so a focus came into being that uh, the prescription of uh, opioids became much more common for treating even chronic pain. What re research tells us today is opioids are not effective um, for chronic long-term pain. They're very effective and should be used medically for short-term pain. The reason for that is that you build such a tolerance so quickly to opioids, to narcotics, you build that tolerance and therefore you need greater and greater amounts to get the same desired effect to control the pain. But that was the beginning really of looking at pain in a different way. And you all know what happened after that. It, it mushroomed into this huge, huge public health crisis that even the Center of Disease Control going back 10 years started to describe it as a crisis. But what I think is important for us to understand about opioids is if you look at some of the opioids that were once prescribed for pain that are now, for instance, the drug fentanyl, back in the day when I was way younger, Fentanyl was a medication that was prescribed only for very terminally ill people in hospice. It was when you were, it was really before death to control serious pain. Today it can be bought on the streets and people die from it all the time because it is a thousand times stronger than the regular narcotic. And um, it has created a real heroin addiction because one oxycodone pill on the streets. So it's no longer doctors creating it as much because they have gotten it under control. One oxycodone pill costs $40 about on the street, whereas a bag of heroin is extremely cheap. So it has increased um, heroin addiction by leaps and bounds because of the cost of it. But it's not Opioids have been a part of our history. I just want to read you something that's in one of, I read it in one of the books uh, probably last year, but it really struck me. And it's by a Dr. W.G. Rogers. And it was in a newspaper in, on January 25th in 1884 um, in Richmond, Virginia. And it was in the newspaper, The Daily Dispatch. And this is what he said in 1884. This evil is confined to no class or occupation. It's not, it, it numbers among its victims, some of the best women and men of all classes. Prompt action is then demanded, lest our land should become stupefied by the direful effects of narcotics and thus diseased physically, mentally, and morally the love of liberty swallowed up by the love of opium, whilst the masses of our people would become a fit subject for a despot. So even in 1884, this was a huge issue. And what this doctor saw was it took over the lives. It altered the structure and function of the people's brains. There was no focus, there was no neurobiology studies then. But he saw what was happening even back then. And it just, you know, the behavior. So he says it affects people mentally and physically and morally. That's what you see, that a person's whole life changes. So the behaviors, things that you, a person would never have done are affected. So, you know, it's really morally, you know, there's my clients in 12 step programs talk about, 
you know, becoming what they call morally bankrupt. And so it affects people on so many different levels, but it's not a new issue. It's crisis proportions, but it was very big even in 1884. And what happens in throughout history is it waxes and it wanes. So different drugs become bigger issues at different times. And now you have the opioid crisis in huge, huge numbers, people dying every single day. Combine that with what's happening in COVID and it's really huge. Yeah, it's, it's a scary time at this particular moment. <laughs> and I think a lot of us are feeling it on so many layers. Um, you did bring up 12-step um, programs. So with that, I'd love to ask you, so when you're thinking about effective clinical treatments, and we always know that obviously they're individualized for each patient, but can you talk a little bit more about the effectiveness of different clinical treatments, 12-step, subgrade dynamics, CBT, DBT, and probably anything else that I haven't mentioned? Sure, and I love what you said because social workers were so well aligned to really work with this particular population because one, we're trained to be non-judgmental. I can tell you being trained many, many years ago in a healthcare profession, not social work, um, there was a lot of judgment. There is still a lot of judgment in society about substance abusers. However, social workers are so well aligned because we really do come from, we meet each person where they are and we come from a non-judgmental stance so that I'll go through some of the treatments. CBT is really a treatment of choice. It has a large evidence base behind it and it works very, very well with substance abusers. Certainly coming out, so the beginning of treatment involves usually um, some, if a person has, so if we think about the dimensional components of substance abuse as defined by DSM, you have mild, moderate, and severe. By the time someone has reached severe, they have lost the ability to choose as to whether they use the substance or not. So if you think of treatments, CBT can be useful at all levels. I always talk about the continuum and the continuum in the beginning of use, social use, if we think about the drug alcohol, the central nervous system depressant alcohol, nothing wrong with social use of alcohol. But then if a person continues, if they develop tolerance, which is an early sign of a problem, they begin to develop a tolerance, they may move along that continuum and get into abuse. And what abuse, um, if you look at abuse, what that signals is the person continues to use in spite of adverse consequences. So the average person, if they're a social drinker, for instance, if we're looking at alcohol, and they begin to experience some negative consequences, they begin to look at that and they make a decision not to do it. Well, <laughs> the difference in somebody who's reached the point of substance abuse is they continue to use in spite of adverse consequences. If they mo move along that continuum, they move into the state of severe use as defined by DSM. And um, severe use, if you think about treatment, very often it evolves, and there certainly is, I don't know if we'll have time to talk about harm reduction. Harm reduction can be very useful and is focused on decreasing harm of the user as it's not about going in and telling someone you need to stop using, it's about decreasing harm. What you want to consider is if someone has lost the ability to choose, meaning they have reached that severe level, decreasing harm may not help enough to save a life. They may have reached that point where they're so ill, they've crossed over that line. So if we look at evidence-based treatments, um, Certainly the model of motivational interviewing is very, very, uh, how can I say? It's really a great way of approaching substance abusers. It's non-confrontational and it begins to, it works with um, uh, really the client's resistance, that not looking at resistance as a problem, but as an opportunity an opportunity to understand that when a client's resistance comes to the surface, that's an opportunity for us as clinicians and treatment professionals, because it shows us it's usually about fear. 
fear of giving up, you know, the use of that substance, fear that the person won't be successful, but gently looking, helping a person look at the risks and the benefits of their use in a non-judgmental way, hoping to motivate the person to uh, change moving in the direction of health. So motivational interviewing developed by um, uh, Rolnick and De Clemente, one of my heroes, and uh, begun to be used by William Miller, Dr. William Miller, because he saw that confronting clients in the way that I talked about with their use, you're going to die, did not work. So then we know then, and it's evidence-based over, it has a strong evidence base that the non-confrontational method of motivational interviewing, motivational enhancement therapy work best. Cognitive work very well, I should say. There's no one best. At least research hasn't found that. So, um, then you have cognitive behavioral treatment, which is extremely beneficial in working with substance abusers and people who have addictive disorders. It works with the triggers. We know that relapse is very much a part of this illness and that people, in, especially in the first 90 days and in the first year, are more prone to relapse, although relapse can happen at any point in time with this illness. But it helps um, so we know that CBT is about thought creates behaviors, thought creates action, I always say. So when the person gets the thought to use and is triggered, we, we define them as triggers, you can work with the client on developing ways to deal with those triggers. It's very helpful in early recovery and even more helpful as you move along because the person's thinking, they learn to change the way they think, which helps them deal with those um, thoughts to use along, as well as the feelings and the behaviors that go along with it. So then you have um, dialectical behavioral therapy, which I, I need to say that CBT and motivational interviewing the research has very large sample numbers. Sample numbers count in research. It counts how many people were in a study. So they, those have very big numbers. Dialectical behavioral therapy developed by a social worker, um, uh, Marsha Linehan, has been effective, but the sample sizes are smaller and it gives uh, clients that have substance use disorders sort of a toolbox that they can use. It's a blend of Eastern and Western um, methods or tools that can help people be more mindful and it can help them deal with their substance use issues. Sample sizes are much smaller. Um, and then you have EMDR, eye motivation reprocessing, reprocessing, and that has even smaller sample sizes, but it has been work, it has been used. I think what I have seen in my career and what has the biggest numbers behind it is motivational interviewing, cognitive behavioral therapy, group therapy is truly the treatment of choice because a group can help hold up a mirror to a client to help them see because they've been there um, when they may be in denial or they may be rationalizing their use or even getting ready for a relapse. 12 step programs have been enormously, although they don't have as much research behind it because it is based on the cornerstone of 12 step programs is the concept of anonymity. So that um, people can go there for help from peers. It is not professionally listed, but for all of the students that will be taking their licensing exam, I always used to call it peer assisted therapy. Um, it is now a form of, recognized as a formal form of treatment. I used to call it adjunctive, an adjunct to treatment. The licensing exam now calls it a form of treatment. So that's important to note. And it works on the premise of people, ex, a sort of unconditional positive regard that no matter how people call go down the, far down the line you've got, you go there, you're accepted. People understand it's based on the 12 steps, which a, which a sponsor usually 
um, help someone go through. And what I always say to clients is Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous is available 24 hours a day. I am not. <laughs> so, and it gives 24 hour peer support, which can be really invaluable. It's not for everyone. Not everyone will be successful attending a 12 step meeting. So what I love about social workers is that we can assess the client, work with the client and help collaborate to develop a plan that meets the client where they are and works for them. Thank you so much. I really appreciate all that additional information. Um, I, anyone who hasn't um, attended an AA meeting, I highly recommend it. Um, I got the opportunity last semester when I took the substance treatment course um, here at Fordham, and it was a wonderful experience um, and to see what they experience and what everyone experienced. I shouldn't say they. Um, so moving forward, we're getting near the time of Q&A. So I'd be remiss if I didn't ask the most important question of the afternoon, which is as baby social workers, thinking about a life um, after grad school and specifically students that aren't currently in a working in the field, um, what do you suggest to make ourselves more desirable for employment or additional support? You've already mentioned mentioned um, KSAC already. Um, so that's something we'd have to do independently. So can you speak to that? What what should we be doing to prepare ourselves to be working with a substance abuse population? Well, I think that some of you will choose to work with that population. I will say it's a wide open field. There are many, many jobs um, available in the substance abuse field, both inpatient, outpatient, long-term treatment, short-term treatment. So the options are limitless. I think, um, you know, the KSAC is a great credential. I'm very glad I have it. What's great about social work school, for those of you who have not taken the substance abuse class, I think it's an important class. But if you do your, um, if you do your placement in a substance use facility in, in New York State, you can get what's called the KSAC T, which is the KSAC in training. And what that gives you, it's not a KSAC. You have to sit for an exam and get supervised hours for that. But it gives you the 350 New York State required education hours that everyone needs if they want to get to eventually get a KSAC. So it's great because you're not paying for it here. You're paying plenty here, but otherwise you can do it outside. You can take classes after you graduate. I think that even if you choose not to work in the field of substance abuse, what is so critically important is to understand that 10% of the population and probably more have issues with substance abuse. That 10%, have families, friends, employers, it affects all segments of society. The more you uh, educate yourself about substance abuse and understand that even if you choose not to work with uh, people with addictive disorders, you will work with their families, their children, um, their extended families, communities, organizations are affected because substance abuse is a very real illness that affects people working in organizations. So the more you're prepared to deal with um, people affected by substance use disorders, I think you make yourself that much more marketable. So before going to an interview, I would prepare myself for at least, at least a little bit to be able to discuss what you have learned about substance use because it's such a widespread problem. But please know that it is extremely, not only has it been my honor and privilege to work with this population and their families, there is such a need and there are so many jobs out there in this field. And, you know, as you see someone start to, you know, go into recovery and they may relapse, but it is really very, very beneficial. This is an illness that doesn't discriminate in any way, it can affect anyone across economic, racial, uh, socio, all different levels. It is not a discriminatory, a discriminatory illness and it hijacks, literally hijacks people's brains. So there's lots of jobs and that's how I would prepare myself. 
Thank you. I definitely appreciate that. So we have a few questions already in the chat that I'm going to go towards first. And then if anyone else in the um, on the call wants to ask questions, you're welcome to add them to the chat or you use the raise hand function in Zoom and we'll move around the room that way. So um, one of the first questions that I have here is from Miss Hannah. Um, so how do you think pharmaceutical companies should be held accountable for the role they've played in perpetuating addiction? Well, they have been held accountable. There have been numerous multiple lawsuits and multi, you know, multi, multi million dollars have been allocated from um, the pharmaceutical companies and the family in particular at the heart of the opioid crisis. We don't have time to go into that whole history, but that, ha though, that has been given to families who've lost people due to the opioid crisis, but it's also been given to large segments of in different communities to de develop treatment for people with addictive disorders. So they are being held accountable. The, it, some of the lawsuits have been remarkably successful against the pharmaceutical companies. I would like to ask just a little bit thing to add on to Hannah's question. So we're talking about pharmaceutical companies, um, but where have you seen the um, responsibility with the doctors that are actually doing the prescription prescribing? Because I know that that was a huge problem with pain clinics. It was a huge problem. And there were many, many um, what we called pill mills where doctors actually prescribing it is, they have really, really started to prosecute as a, at a much larger level. I'm not gonna say it does not exist. Um, however, the, the uh, legal implications are far stronger. And it's almost, you know, it's very interesting. It's almost gone to the other side. A good friend's daughter had four wisdom teeth removed and was in a lot of pain and they do not prescribe, they're giving Tylenol now. So it, you know, doctors in general prescribe less. That doesn't mean that there aren't some out there. The real problem with that now is people in chronic pain. We know that opioids long-term don't work well. The research evidence is strong, but we need to work on developing alternative ways of helping people don't deal long-term with chronic pain. Thank you. And then one more question from the chat and then we'll go to Nicole next. Um, oh, okay. So from she says, how has COVID impacted community-based peer support programs? Uh, well, you know, if you think about um, peer support and 12-step programs, just like we at school, they had to overnight, overnight transfer everything to Zoom. So what, what my students in the substance abuse class told me last summer, is um, because it was all new to me too. So how do I say to a student, okay, you can go to a Zoom meeting now. And they were in meetings with people in other countries. It was very impressive. But at first, listen, you know, the truth is it has increased relapse among people who were in recovery. It has increased alcohol and substance abuse because of the isolation and the alienation coupled with the tremendous losses loss of income, loss of people. How many people have lost people close to them due to COVID? So all of those factors have impacted recovery, people in recovery. But I do believe that the treatment centers, a lot of the treatment centers and the 12-step programs have done a pretty remarkable job of being available. I had a client in my private practice. My private practice is very small these days. But she told me because of her alienation, she has many years of recovery. She's not working, she lost her job. She sometimes goes to two meetings a day on Zoom just for the support for to be with people. No, it's wonderful how adaptive those group um, therapies became so quickly with little notice. Um, so Nicole, if you're comfortable unmuting yourself, go ahead and ask your question. Hi. Hi. Right. Um, so I have a question. So my internship now, I'm working with adolescents with um, substance use issues and um, I struggle a lot to engage them. So I'm wondering what your best advice is, um, Professor, to you yeah, know, so I think, adolescents who are not interested in stopping their drug use. Yeah, so I, I don't really work with adolescents to try to interest them that. I sort of try to go through a back door. So this is the way I do it because it's most of my population. And believe me, doing research with older adults, older adults are always happy to see you. Teenagers, not so much. So they usually come because of pressure from parents 
or I have gotten over the years tremendous uh, amount of referrals from the school systems. And so adolescents come in feeling that people are against them, the adults are against them. So the way I have um, found success in working with adolescents is to meet them exactly where they are, just let them tell me how bad, you know, that there's nothing wrong and everyone does it. As uh, a young person said to me just last year around this time before the pandemic, let's face it, Dr. White Ryan, everyone is smashed. So what do you say to that? Do you know what I mean? That is the adolescent culture, the peer-based culture. Um, so I think one of the things is begin to, I begin to talk to adolescents about what their goals are. So what do you look forward to in the future? And, you know, lots of times, a lot a favorite one of adolescents is to tell me, I want to make a lot of money. I want to make a lot of money. Or we talk about what they see themselves doing in the future. And what I begin to do, it's, it's really, it's just a risk benefit ratio, but we begin to look at what their goals are for themselves. And then gently I begin to ask them about their substance use and do they see their substance use or abuse helping them move closer to that goal or further away from that goal? So I try to meet them at the point of what they value, what, they're, what is important to them besides the substance use to begin to look at that and to work from that point forward so that what motivational interviewing is doing is working with not only rolling with resistance, but it's working with the client's ambivalence. So remember that when you're working with a substance abuser, whether it's an adolescent or it's an adult or an older adult, because it's an epidemic among older adults in our country, uh, 85 and older is the fastest growing segment of society and substance abuse is now being called the invisible epidemic. But understand that when you work with a substance abuser or someone with an addictive disorder, that you cannot discount the benefits they're getting from it. They're getting something from it. And so I need to give them the space to talk about it helps me be with my friends. All my friends are doing it. So you want to look at what they're getting from it and what do they feel they would be losing if they gave it up? What does your life look like if you didn't go out every Friday night and get, you know, get high? What, what do you think your life would look like? Well, I would miss my friends. I wouldn't be part of the gang. What does that look like? You know, somebody, if a young person becomes invested in it, then what I do is work with peer refusal skills. How can they stay connected and yet be able to uh, refuse um, using? But for somebody who truly already has a problem, you try to let them voice what they're getting from it. Because if we right away say it's bad for you, this is going to hurt you, you lose the person whether they're a young person or an adult, they're getting something out of it. And we need to actually give, make the space for the first person to talk about that. Does that help? I don't know, Nicole. Yes, that helped me so much. Thank you so, so much. That was a great you're answer. Welcome. You're Thank welcome. You. I really enjoyed how you were just speaking, Dr. White Ryan. I literally wrote goals, arrow, motivational interviewing. What does this look like? Arrow, CBT. So you're really helping me solidify these things that I'm we're learning in school and seeing how it can translate in, in person working with substance abuse. So thank I'm you. I'm so glad. Um, so from the chat again, um, why do you think that 12-step programs don't work for some people? Well, I think, look, I think just the way we learn in the first day of social work school that we meet the client where they are, we're all different. We have similarities. Same with substance use disorders. There are many similarities. Addiction is a chronic um, brain disease. However, each person is different. And sometimes the, you know, what I say to people is, look, if you got, I always try to get people to go to 12 step meetings. That's, you know, I try to work with them and at least make, I develop a contract with everyone I work with. Okay, so you'll try three meetings. And if they go to one meeting and they say, they were all jerks there, I didn't like them. Or I, they, you know, too many people were trying to hug me <laughs> before the pandemic. You know, I say, okay, we'll try another one, you know? And so 
giving them the opportunity because in the beginning, the resistance is very much a part of the process. If a person gives it an honest try, and I try to sort of uh, work with the person to attend as many as possible, eventually a lot of people then will get something out of it and start to develop relationships. It's really about a tremendous um, support system. There are so many people there to support them, but if they absolutely can't do it, I don't judge that. I just try to develop other ways for the person to develop a support system. That's most important, social support. What is the best way for you to develop social support? I think it works for a lot of people. It does not work for everyone. And that I know, you know, because I've experienced it. And I have to tell you, early on when I was working with this population, I was much more judgmental. I didn't realize it then. But I was much more judgmental, like you, this, this is important, you have to do this. Because back in the day, we were much more confrontational. I've learned that that doesn't work. So I meet the client where they are and work with them from there. But it does work for a lot of people, but not everyone. Thank you. Um, yes, having those social supports, those protective factors are really, really huge. Um, so from the chat again, can students going to their specialist year in the fall take the substance abuse class in the summer, so prior to going into their specialist year, um, or do students have to take the class at the same time when they're placed at a substance abuse internship? No, lots of students take it the summer before. I think it's really great. If you can, I happen to teach it in the summer too, but that's not the reason I'm saying that. Um, I think that if you take it ahead of time, it can be really beneficial because it gives you that template and that understanding before you start the placement. But lots of students take it at the same time. But going into your specialist year, you, you will take the substance abuse course either before, right before the, sub, the specialist year. And you must do a placement at a substance where you're working with substance abuse clients and you need to tell your field placement coordinator that you're interested in, in receiving the case act -T. and please note the case act -T is only for new york state however i have um, completed many forms for people in connecticut and new jersey but there's a little bit different requirements so but we have an agreement dr turner i see is here she is my she is my leader here and she has worked so closely with oasis and she has really been the faculty member who's been the most instrumental in developing the agreement we have with New York State for the Case Act T. Hi, Dr. Turner. <laughs> That's wonderful to know. Um, you're asking all the right questions, fellow classmates, because those are not, I didn't know to ask those questions going into. So unfortunately, I wasn't eligible for the Case Act T. Um, so great questions. Um, into the chat again. Um, are there any policies being considered in city council at the state or federal, federal level um, addressing substance abuse services and programs that you'd like to highlight? Well, I think, you know, at, at those levels, I'm not as informed. I would like to say that I'm more informed, but lots being look, looked at. In Westchester County, I've been part of the opioid, it's really before the pandemic, but the opioid um, strategic movement that really developing policies and options for people addicted to opioids in 2000, I think the most instrumental or one of the most instrumental is the um, is an act, the um, <sighs> Substance Abuse Recovery Act of 2016. That was a federal policy that really began to address providing resources. We don't have time today, but for instance, making sure that there was funding for different treatments, for different medications. Medication-assisted treatment is extremely important in the treatment of substance abuse. Even funding for Narcan, which is the medication that reverses opioid overdoses. Now, Narcan was available when I was a young nurse. That's a really long time ago. It was injectable, people coming into the ER. Narcan is now given um, intranasally. Everyone can get a kit. Everyone can be trained to use it. And that really is a result of the movement 
moving forward from that policy in 2016 that really worked towards providing resources for the general population for a family that has a young person that's an opioid addict that has it in their home in case. Do you know what I mean? It's not a pretty thing to think about, but Narcan reverses opioid overdoses and has saved countless lives. So funding for all of that, but we still, having said that, I just wanna go on record as saying that there are still a, a huge healthcare disparities in our country about who can access treatment, who gets you know, services and who gets treatment. And we still really, it is a, it is a, all of our problem. Substance abuse is society's problem um, because it is so widespread. And so we need on a societal, a community, a federal and a state level to develop policies and make treatment available. It's all of our problem. It's so widespread. Very inspiring. Um, so let's all join hands and do something about it. Um, I did want to just touch a little bit on Narcan. If you're not familiar, um, you can pick up a Narcan kit at basically any pharmacy. I do recommend, because it's COVID, just to call ahead of time that you want to pick one up, but they are available at your CVSs and your Rite Aids. Um, into the chat, oh, one more time, we have, do you think mental health education in schools early on and accessibility in communities through healthcare would help substance abuse prevention? I think um, prevention is really, really important. And I think what helps young people, and I have developed workshops, I, prevent, I presented in numerous school systems in lots of places. And this is what I think is the most powerful. And it's not um, Linda White Ryan coming in and talking to the kids, whether they're elementary school kids or um, adolescents. Yes, yes, that can be, look, knowledge is power. But if you look at adolescents and where they are on the lifespan, what has the biggest influence is peer influence. So having people, either their own peers trained you know, uh, peer counseling models, I think can really be helpful. Um, and also the most impact, and I saw it at a like, lo local high school that I had talked at many times, but was invited by the principal to come and hear a young man in his twenties that had been to prison and he was out now, and this was part of his message that he had um, been in a car accident. Um, he was not driving but he was in the accident with other teens, late teens, very mood altered, very drunk. He had been in prison for a year. People died in the car crash, both in the car he was in as well as the other car. And when I tell you, you could hear, a when he came out onto the stage and he started to approach the young people, in that um, auditorium, you could hear a pin drop. And I think that's what has a huge impact on young people for sure. Um, giving lectures is all fine and well for you guys, but I think the impact of someone who has had that lived experience and either has come out on the other side in recovery or has, um, or has had an experience such as this young man has had. I think that's the most impactful or one of the most impactful. I'm not saying that we shouldn't develop, I, I don't wanna be out of a job, but we should be looking at prevention as spreading the message and developing programs that promote prevention. But I think that's very impactful. Um, so Michael's question was, how do you engage many clients that are in the housing first model? Housing first model, I, I'm not even, look, I'm not even that familiar with that model, but the way that you would engage people is the same in, oops, in all ways, meeting the person where they are, understanding, especially for populations that are our most vulnerable in society, trying to provide resources for them, but number one, letting them know that you hear them. The way I mentioned a few moments ago about working with an adolescent, you know, going in and lecturing to an adolescent and telling them that I know better will never work. 
in a million years. You know, I'm not going to go in and agree with the adolescent and say, oh, all the adults in your life are terrible. However, meeting them where they are. So I'm not familiar with that model, but I'm assuming just from the uh, name, engagement is about creating a safe space for the person that you are with or the community, the group, the community, creating that sacred safe space where people can share what's really going on for them, where they don't have to feel like it will not be accepted, that we will not be able to hear or accept what they have to say. That's the best I can offer because I don't know what it is. Perfect. Well, hopefully he can connect with you after this. Okay. So um, we are at the two minute mark to 1.30. So I'd love to then just give the floor to you um, and say some closing remarks, um, Dr. White Ryan. Well, I think I can only say that um, thank you so much for having me. It is working, as I said earlier, my honor and my privilege to work with substance abusers and their families but it is also my passion. It has been the focus of my research, of my publications, and, um, and all of that, at the heart of all of that is the sincerest desire that people understand that people with substance use disorders are people and they are important people. And it is a disease like other disease. Having said that, it has very difficult behaviors that often go along with it, but um, healing is possible. And we are the light bearers. We go out as light bearers into the world. And it is my hope that all of us as social workers will really um, be instrumental in decreasing stigma and do the best we can to let people know that this is an illness and people, um, all people with substance use disorders, all people, deserve treatment and that the healthcare disparities with this illness and with all illnesses will begin to be addressed on a much larger, larger level in our society. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. White Ryan. We did have one question we didn't get to, so I'll definitely um, send that to you via email to see if maybe you can connect with Neil um, outside of this. Um, I want to thank um, everyone that attended today, uh, whether you be faculty, classmates. Um, this was a wonderful opportunity to speak with you, Dr. White Ryan. I feel very privileged. I know I was telling her earlier that I find her a bit of a celebrity watching her asynchronous videos, so I felt very um, excited to be able to well, I wasn't the celebrity. It was the person I was speaking to who's really well. Dr. Di Clemente also a celebrity as well, but um, you're on our on our screens all the time. So um, I'm just gonna pass this off to um, I guess uh, Shadiqwa. Do you want to say anything real quick? I know we're one minute behind, but I just want to again thank everyone for attending. This for me has been very um, a lovely experience. Yeah, I would just say um, thank you. And once again, contact Student Congress and we'd love to um, you know, continue to interact with everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to Student Congress. You're doing amazing things and thank you for inviting me. It's really been really, really an honor for me. So thank you. <laughs>